Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome back to Depictions Media Radio. I am your host, Michael Cloggs. The uh, WHO um, held a press briefing about um, supporting Ukraine. As we know that uh, through UN um, reports and other reports from, from from other countries, getting aid to civilians, medical aid, um, and medicines to some of the areas like Maripol and stating outrage uh, over some of the attacks on civilian sites such as hospitals and, and um, refu- refugee line of trying as, as they're trying to leave the country or trying to get people to safety is against uh, the rules, international laws, and probably, if we really think about it, common decency. And these people mean no harm to any of the Russian soldiers. And those uh, carried in hospital stations could also, well, are also required to, to offer aid to injured uh, Russian soldiers as well. So it doesn't make sense to stop the medical aid or to try to tear down the hospitals that are already there. And yet, this is what they've done, and this is one some of the things that the WHO are trying to address and trying trying to bring to light. You will hear questions about that and and other things in this next press briefing, and there will be some questions about the legalities of it, which um, while there are answers to those questions, and some of the some of the WHO experts may be able to answer on the morality of it and but the legality of of it um, will be left up to as you hear uh, left up to the IRC about how to address what is a war crime and what isn't a war crime so let's listen to what the WHO has to say about getting aid into the Ukrainian civilians and refugees. Welcome to the Ukraine Media Center. Uh, I'm Olga Temanova, and now in our Media Center we are to meet our guests uh, from the World Health Organization and the Minister of Health. And now I'm to give the floor to my co-moderator, uh, Dr. Margaret Harris. Uh, you're welcome. So much, Olga, and thank you so much to the Ukraine Media Center for giving us a great privilege of holding this press conference here. Today we will have four people attending, but we have two speakers. First will be Minister Viktor Lashko, uh, the Minister for Health for Ukraine, whom I'm sure you, whom you all know very well, and. Also speaking next will be Dr. Tedros Adnan Ghebreyesus, our Director General for the World Health Organization. We have two others with us, Dr. Jano Harbik, who is the World Health Organization's representative here in Ukraine. And we have Dr. Mike Ryan, who's our Executive Director for Emergencies, and they will be here to provide information and answer your questions. But now, as the Minister is very pressed for time, I will call on Minister Lashko to please make the first intervention. Uh, Good afternoon. Today, we have the pleasure of welcoming in Ukraine the Director General of the World Health Organization, Tedros Ibrisos, with his team. We have had an intense day today. First of all, we have shown our guests the terrible consequences of what Russian occupants have been doing in Ukraine by shelling residential quarters, shelling civilian hospitals. it can it cannot be left unnoticed so in our discussion with director general i uh, emphasize two sets of issues one is humanitarian one ukraine does need assistance from international partners and it should be uh, 
both to support the uh, health care in terms of medicines, medical devices, medical equipment for us to respond properly to those challenges uh, that war has brought to our country, with full-scale invasion of the Russian Federation. The other block, the other set of issues, set of matters, is political one, because to stop the war you can only do it by exercising maximum pressure on the Russian Federation. Ukraine will win. Our armed forces do the impossible, uh, incredible defending territorial integrity of Ukraine. So I'd like to ask the World Health Organization to take the leadership position to join efforts with the Red Cross, uh, with uh, Doctors Without Borders to provide proper level or control over proper level of medical care for Ukrainian prisoners of war. Uh, they defended their country, Ukraine, and today maybe they don't receive proper health care. Unfortunately, Russian occupants do not allow Russian medics to uh, have access to them. So international organizations should become the driver to save, to rescue Ukrainians who don't do uh, any, anything special, they just do what every Ukrainian has to do, defending their country, defending their families. The second set of matters is political issues, political matters. It's about uh, advisability of uh, existence of WHO's Office for Non-Communicable, Non-Infectious Decisions in, uh, Diseases in Moscow. Because, you know, a, a country can uh, sh be killing with one hand and caring for the life of the whole world and health through WHO with the other hand. So, uh, on the 10th of May, at the regional committee session of the European Regional Office of WHO, and then on the 22nd of May, and the Assembly of WHO will consider those issues, and I would like to ask colleagues for support for us to achieve it. Uh, like, uh, 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 it's also about the political pressure to expel representatives of the Russian Federation from the Executive Committee of the WHO. Everybody in Russia should understand that Ukraine is a free democratic country which has been fighting and defending its freedom. And unfortunately, uh, we are defending it, losing lives of our citizens, including healthcare workers. Uh, oh, during the time of this war, 10 of my colleagues have died and more than 40 colleagues have been wounded. 40 hospitals have been destroyed to the level that they cannot be uh, restored. We have visited one of those. About 500 hospitals have been damaged, so medical services cannot be provided there. All this violates the motto of the World Health Organization, which is health for everybody. Unfortunately, today we cannot provided because there are military action, uh, there is warfare, and it's dangerous not only for preventive services, but also treatment is dangerous for all Ukrainians because the Russian Federation has violated all Geneva Conventions, has violated international laws using prohibited weapons which cause destruction. So I, as the Ministry of Health, ask everybody who cares about hum uh, humanitarian aspects to use their political uh, factors to maximum extent to do everything possible and even impossible to stop war in Ukraine. The Russian Federation should uh, leave the territory of the independent, free, democratic Ukraine. Thank you for your attention. Minister Lashko, and now I call upon Dr. Tedros, Dr. Tedros Adnam Ghebreyesus, the World Health Organization Director General, to make his remarks about his visit here in Ukraine. Your Excellency, Minister Viktor Lyashko, members of the media, good evening and thank you all uh, for joining us this evening. I have spent the last two days in Ukraine and have been deeply moved by what I have seen and what I have heard. I have also had the honor of meeting with Prime Minister Shimhal, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, Zaparova, and others. We discussed the health situation in Ukraine and how WHO can best support the Ministry of Health to deliver care 
in conflict areas, as well as to sustain care for those who need it throughout Ukraine. My time here has affected me very personally. As someone, myself, who grew up in a war zone, I understand only too well how the people of Ukraine feel. The worry for family and friends, the fear, the sense of loss, and so on. Because I know the impact, I know the devastation of war firsthand. And I felt very, very sad when Russia invaded Ukraine because I know its impact and devastation. However, I have seen extraordinary resilience. People who have suffered loss and destruction but have not given up. They have kept going, repairing essential services to stop that destruction, making a deeper hole in their lives. I have seen the damage inflicted on health structures and listened to accounts of the harm, physical and mental, inflicted on health workers. These are people whose primary motivation is to protect health and life. WHO has now verified 200 attacks on health care in Ukraine since the war began. These attacks must stop. Health care is never a target. While I saw and learned of great suffering, I also saw bravery, humor, kindness, and heard stories of spontaneous, often ingenious ways people have found to help and protect one another. Some of those I'm talking about are our own WHO staff, who although they have lost their homes, fear for their families, deal with daily uncertainty, have kept working to support the health needs of the people of Ukraine. Our team in Ukraine was working hard to support the country to build an ever stronger health system before the war. And that work will continue. Since Russia invaded Ukraine, WHO has delivered trauma and emergency supplies for use in over 15,000 surgeries and enough medicines and healthcare equipment to serve 650,000 people. We have also provided 15 diesel generators to provide electricity to hospitals and health facilities, some in the newly accessible areas in Kyiv Oblast, which I just visited this afternoon. And we are handing over 20 ambulances tomorrow. WHO has also supported or coordinated more than 50 emergency medical teams in Ukraine and neighboring countries hosting refugees. And in past months, we have trained thousands of Ukrainian healthcare providers on how to handle mass casualties. This includes training on hospital blood transfusions in conflict settings, traumatic limb injuries, emergency nursing care, and essential burns care. We have also established three health hubs 
in Western Ukraine to support medical evacuations and ensured safe medical evacuation of patients, including those suffering from cancer for treatment outside Ukraine. These are just a few examples of the work we are doing. I have been very moved by the resilience of the Ukrainian people, the bravery of Ukraine's health workers, the dedication of our own WHO staff, and the commitment of the Ministry of Health under his leadership and the government of Ukraine to protecting health in these terrible circumstances. My message to all the people of Ukraine is that WHO stands with you. We will do everything we can to support the government in its efforts to treat the injured, maintain health services, and to repair and strengthen Ukraine's health systems. But there is one medicine that WHO cannot deliver, and which Ukraine needs more than any other, and that is peace. So we continue to call on the Russian Federation to stop this war. Thank you. Jacquie. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. I'll now open the floor to questions. Uh, as I should remind you, both speakers are very pressed for time, so we will not be able to ask many questions. But please give your name, your media outlet, and please indicate who your question is to. I'm looking at the floor now. I can see yeah, the sure. If possible, Margaret, now we will start with Ukraine Forum, Ukrainian National New Agency. We have two questions for Director General, and the questions are as follows. How WHO handles the issue of catastrophe in those occupied territories, the shortage of medicines, shortage of medical staff, and how the WHO responds to the needs of Ukrainians in the occupied areas, occupied by Russians? Maybe better answered by Dr. Habicht, I think, because that's very specific. Thank you for the question. What WHO has been doing in more than 70 days as the war has been going on in Ukraine has asked the corridors to ensure then the humanitarian corridors to Luhansk, to Donetsk, as well as now to Mariupol, many other places, to ensure that the humanitarian goods, including medicines and the trauma kits and others that the healthcare workers need, are reaching to those places. There are uh, convoys, uh, UN humanitarian convoys, multi-agency, that have reached to Sumi and some places where also now access is available. So we ask the corridors to ensure that the civilians have the support. In the past week, together with many, including the UN and ICRC, we have been with our team in the field in Saporozhye, part of the evacuation from Mariupol. And this is very practical what we do to ensure that those who are able to move can get quick care and support from mental health to any other treatment that they need and our team is there, and we continue to do that. So humanitarian corridors and those who are evacuated to provide them the essential care as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Habeck. Uh, the next question. Hi there. I'm Bardi Afshin from Volent Media, Iran International. Dr. Tedros, Dr. Ryan, Dr. Heist. It's good to see you after two years, which hasn't been really easy for you, and I do appreciate you did put your heart and soul to tackle a world pandemic. My question is, would you consider targeting uh, healthcare facilities a, an act of war, a war crime? Thank you. I think this might be one for Dr. Ryan to answer. Um, 
Uh, good evening, everyone. Dr. Mike Ryan. Yes, uh, intentional attacks on healthcare facilities are a breach of international humanitarian law. And as such, based on investigation and, and attribution of the attack, represent war crimes in any situation. Um, <clears throat> we've seen, as the Director General has outlined, uh, verified over 200 attacks on healthcare here in Ukraine. Uh, that is what we've been able to verify. That does not represent the totality of that. Under the Resolution 2286 of the uh, United Nations General Assembly, WHO is tasked with documenting and verifying those events, and it is then the job of the Secretary General's Office and the International Criminal Court and others to investigate the criminal aspects of those attacks. Uh, attacks on healthcare in the context of Ukraine and in so many other contexts, uh, from a WHO perspective, when those attacks are intentional, when those attacks are used as a part of the tactic of war to terrorize communities, to, to, to take away hope that people have for the future, that is the essential objective in these situations. Uh, and it is very clear in international law that it is not only the responsibility of conflicting parties not to attack health care facilities, but to deliberately not target them. So this uh, discussion we have around collateral damage or accidents, we have to ask our questions, how many accidents can you have uh, before you uh, are in a situation where it is completely and utterly unacceptable? And the Director General has said this on so many occasions. Utterly unacceptable to deliberately target healthcare facilities and the health workers that are in there, the patients that are in there. So from WHO's perspective, we continue to document and bear witness to these attacks. We will continue to publish on these attacks, and we understand and we trust that the UN system and the International Criminal Court and others will take up the necessary investigations in order to assess the criminal intent behind these attacks. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Uh, the next question in the room it looks like everybody's satisfied. This may be a good time. I think the Minister would like to go. So I'm going to just ask the Minister and Dr. Tedros if they've got any final remarks. No. So I'm going to say thank you very much to all of you and again to the Media Center and Olga for your warm welcome and uh, really appreciate the time here. and. Thank you very much. We will make all the materials available uh, in due course. Thank you very much. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.